World War II was no joke, and the number of human beings killed as a direct or indirect result is staggering. My jaw drops every single time I read into it, and you can't help but take a step back and contemplate how those figures are far, far more than just that. Every one of them represents a human being and a whole genetic line. Military persons, of course, make up a pretty large portion of these figures, and in this series, we're going to look into not only military deaths, but some of the most catastrophic military casualties, which we define as including deaths, injuries, illnesses, captures, and even desertions. We'll be looking through a fairly broad scope, considering freakish casualties to military units on the scale of formations to commands, while keeping that scope pointed at identifiable military operations, rather than attempting to encompass the war as a whole. It's also important to note that it's pretty much impossible to calculate casualties with precision, and the actual military casualties may be far less, or far more, than the figures gathered for this series. In this third entry to the series, our scope encompasses the Western Front, the Mediterranean and the Middle Eastern Theatre, and all the operations therein. After landing in Sicily in July 1943 and Italy in September, the Allies intended to punch up through Italy and liberate Rome. To do this, they needed to penetrate the German Winter Line, which included the Gustav Line. While fighting over the Gustav Line, both sides lost a great deal of men. Death claimed most of her victims in the town of Cassino and Monte Cassino, the 6th century Benedictine Abbey on the hill behind the town. Harassed by incredibly accurate German artillery, the Allies assumed the Germans had eyes in the Abbey at the very least, so they caved in the Abbey's head with a raid from the sky, only for the Germans to occupy the ruins right after. The next Allied attempt to capture the town and Abbey was beaten back, so the Allies bombed the town before trying and failing once more. Throwing themselves against the hill three times now, the Allies had taken massive casualties, yet their objectives remained in German grip. Only on their fourth offensive, Operation Diadem, and with great many reinforcements, were the Allies finally able to seize the town and abbey and penetrate the Gustav Line. These offenses are known collectively as the Battle of Monte Cassino, and the Allied victory here, among other victories in the area, allowed them to continue upward and break Dora and hit the lines on their approach to Rome, which they liberated from Nazi occupation on the 4th of June 1944. Once reinforced in Operation Diadem, the Allies had about 240,000 men toiling for the Winter Line. These were soldiers of the US 5th Army, commanded by Lieutenant General Mark W. Clark and the British 8th Army, commanded by General Sir Bernard Montgomery. Notably, the Polish 2nd Corps attributed to the 8th Army and were understandably a little more than eager to kill some Germans. While the German Army Group C were defending Italy in the Winter Line, the German 10th Army was the primary contender in the Battle of Monte Cassino. While the total strength of German forces involved in the battle is unknown, there were at least elements of nine divisions there at some point, and command of the 10th Army was the task of General Heinrich von Fietinghoff. The belligerents fought and died in difficult river crossings, bridges, bridgeheads, flooded valleys, rocky hills and mountains littered with boulders, ravines, gullies and goat tracks. Room to room in the pulverized town and in the ruins of the Benedictine Abbey, the Allies fought uphill against machine gun and artillery positions and had to negotiate mines, barbed wire and booby traps, all while the rain turned the battlefield into a freezing mire. Major Hardy Parkhurst of the British Royal Northumberland Fusiliers describes what he saw. All the trees were naked, stark and leafless. Route 6 dwindled into a sheep track, which wound its way through the shell craters, bomb craters and corn remains of the houses. The whole of the area in front of the town was a ghastly marsh, caused by lack of drainage and the bombs and shell which had blown everything to pieces. All craters are filled with water which stank horribly and were often a very watery grave.
Andy Stevens tells the story of his father, Albert Leonard Stevens of the 2 7th Battalion of the Queen's Royal Regiment, who was only 23 in the Battle of Monte Cassino. Fleeing after Germans had overrun his battalion's position, a grenade blew up right next to him and he was thrown into the air. Albert remembers hitting the ground, rolling and falling over a ridge where he blacked out. When he woke, Albert described his left boot as being bloated and distorted and his left lower leg being little more than shredded skin. Alone on the side of the frigid mountain, he waited for death until he was eventually taken to a cave full of wounded German soldiers. There, German soldiers, probably of the 29th Panzer Grenadiers or the 94th Infantry Division, treated Albert, removing shrapnel and amputating his shredded leg from below the knee. While he was taken as a POW, he made a full recovery and eventually got back to be a father to Andy. Another son tells the story of his father, Polish Karol Jawszewski, who was in charge of a medical team under the Polish 2nd Corps in the Battle of Monte Cassino. Carol tended to injured soldiers and picked up bodies, and his son wrote that Carol had tears in his eyes, remembering caring for badly injured soldiers, some with limbs blown up, who were overjoyed by the victory. Carol's son continued, they were dying not being able to see their loved ones, yet their victory was sweeter than death. Carol finally got home in April 1947 after being forced to stay in England after capturing Bologna from the Germans in April 1944. Carol's son remembers holding his father's hand at the bus stop when he was leaving to join the Polish army in 1939. When he saw his father again, he was 8 years older. While the original strength of the German 10th army is unknown, it sustained somewhere around 20,000 casualties defending the winter line in the Battle of Monte Cassino, and while the Allies were victorious, the US 5th Army and the British 8th Army's toil against the German defences resulted in around 55,000 casualties. In the mountains over Cassino, the Polish 2nd Corps took a German position which was soon recaptured by the Germans. They slugged it out for three days, though on the 12th of May, the Germans chased the Poles out with artillery and mortars, almost obliterating the leading battalions and inflicting just shy of 3,800 casualties. On the 16th of May, the Poles made an attack on Monte Cassino, and after taking many more casualties, planted a Polish flag in the ruins on the 18th, signifying Allied victory. After the Allied landings in Operation Overlord, American and British forces had pushed up through France and into Belgium, holding the forested Ardennes region shared between those two countries and Luxembourg. Der Führer pulled many of his best men from the Eastern Front to launch the Ardennes counter-offensive known as the Battle of the Bulge. Hitler's intent was to cut the Allies off from the port of Antwerp in Belgium, sever their lines and ultimately hammer them until they negotiated for peace. This dream of his relied mostly on bad weather. The Allies had air superiority and the cloud cover would nullify that. It had some success at the start, on the morning of the 16th December of 1944, but the Allies held on to Elsenborn Ridge in the town of Bastogne, choking the German advance, and when the weather cleared up, Allied air swooped in and cut German forces and supply lines to pieces, forcing the survivors to retreat eastward and crippling the German military as a whole. While the Battle of the Bulge devastated the Germans, the Allies also suffered tremendous casualties, with the battle being the largest and the bloodiest for the Americans in World War II. The US 6th Army Group, 12th Army Group and the British commanded 21st Army Group peaked in the Battle of the Bulge at around 700,000 men, though that was after reinforcements had come to the aid of 230,000 Allied troops who copped the first blow of the German counteroffensive. That first punch involved around 410,000 Germans from the Army Group B, which included the 5th and 6th Panzer Armies and the 7th Army. Reinforced, Army Group B peaked on December 24th when it was about 450,000 strong. The great fir trees of the Ardennes, while lush in warmer months, were heavy with snow and a thick fog clung to the region, broken only by pellets of freezing rain. In these misty winter days, soldiers huddled in foxholes in snow camouflage, suffering all manner of cold-induced miseries, trench foot, pneumonia, and frostbite to name a few. US Corporal Kenneth R. Yockey described it. I was assigned to be the jeep driver. With the windshield down over the hood, we had no protection from the bitter cold or piercing wind. 
The weather was sub-zero and the wind felt like sharp knives. If that wasn't enough, the belligerents were, of course, in battle and much of it was waged between tanks and other armoured vehicles, as well as rifle to rifle. The fighting obviously had an effect on the terrain as well. US soldier Charlie Sanderson described it. Did you ever see land when a tornadoes come through? Did you ever see trees and stuff twisted and broken off? The whole friggin forest was like that. US Private First Class Joseph V. Pilateri recounts entering a farmhouse that an American tank had fired into. I went into the room that the show entered. In the room were two German soldiers. One had his head half blown off and I could see his brains moving. The other one had both legs blown off and was in shock. Pilateri went on to describe shooting and capturing a German later in the same encounter. I shot a burst of bullets through his shoulder and collarbone. He started to cry and pick up his overcoat. When I got back to my squad, the prisoner I shot was still crying and he wanted to see his mother. When my sergeant heard him, he wanted to kill him, saying he was thousands of miles from his mother. I got between them and I told my sergeant he was my prisoner and I didn't want more harm to come to him. US veteran Charles F. Atman survived the infamous Malmedy massacre on the 17th of December. After being captured, the Germans herded the American troops into a frozen field. Some of them started pulling out pistols and shooting their prisoners, and then almost immediately they opened fire with machine guns. I hit the ground with the rest and made believe I was dead. We just hoped and prayed while we lay there listening to them shoot every man that moved. After lying there for an hour, with the blood of his friends trickling onto him, Atman and some of the other survivors made a break for it and managed to escape. Atman suffered post-traumatic stress disorder, though this did not stop him from getting home and raising a family. While casualties vary, lower estimations defer that the US 6th Army Group, 12th Army Group and 9th Army suffered 89,500 combined casualties, including 19,000 deaths, 47,500 wounded and 23,000 missings. British casualties were much, much lower, around 1,400. Though German Army Group B was right up there with US Army Groups, with estimates between 63,000 and 98,000. The price of victory for the Allies was steep, though it's argued that the Ardennes counteroffensive cost Hitler the war. On the 13th of September 1940, Italy invaded Egypt, stopping only on the 16th of September when they'd pushed through to Maktila, just beyond Sidi Barani. From there, they spread out and set up five fortified camps around Sidi Barani, where they waited for reinforcements and supplies. In response, General Archibald Wavell ordered Lieutenant General Henry Wilson to push the Italians out of Egypt and back into Libya, an operation under the codename Compass. The British captured Italian fortified camps at Nibaiwa, Tuma West and East and Makita, arresting surrendering forces on the way, before closing in on and taking the town of Sidi Barani and arresting Italians in the Bukbuk area. Having taken so many prisoners, the British were initially unable to continue their enemy's retreat through Libya, so they regathered before rolling through and taking Italian garrisons along the country's northeastern coast, around Jebel Akta and down to El Agaila. At that point, the British had fragmented the Italian army and taken thousands and thousands of prisoners. Lieutenant General Henry Wilson passed the hot potato to Richard O'Connor, who took command of the Western Desert Force, comprised of the 4th Indian Infantry Division and the 7th British Armoured Division. The WDF was about 36,000 strong and supported by the Royal Air Force and Royal Navy. When the WDF regathered before pursuing the fleeing Italians, the 4th Indian Infantry Division was tag team out for the 6th Australian Division. The Italian 10th Army was comprised of 150,000 infantry, 1,600 guns, 600 tanks, and 330 aircraft, and commanded by Marshal Rodolfo Graziani, who doubted the capabilities of his infantry-based force to take on the British and their vehicles. Operation Compass played out through the sand dunes and escarpments of the desert, as well as through the desert and coastal settlements of fortified camps. Tanks, armoured vehicles, and artillery saw heavy use. Bombardments came from the sea and the sky, and one armoured regiment even rode into battle on a sandstorm. 
The days burned and the nights froze, and the winds carried fine sands which got into the eyes and lungs and coated machinery, equipment, and food. Any distance traveled through the desert was twice as costly as any other terrain. It was a logistical nightmare. Frightened, dazed, or desperate Italians erupted from tents and slit trenches, some to surrender supinely, others to leap into battle gallantly, hurling grenades or blazing machine guns in futile belabor of the impregnable intruders. Italian artillerymen gallantly swung their pieces onto the advancing monsters. They fought until return fire from the British tanks stretched them dead or wounded around their limbers. Liborio Bonadonna was a young Italian farmer living in Tripoli, Libya with his wife and parents when he was forced into the Italian army. Liborio was captured by the Allies in Book Book in December 1940 and after three years in POW camps in India, he was sent to Australia to a camp in Cowra, New South Wales. Becoming ill, Liborio was then transferred to Murrix in Victoria where he was considered for reparation based on his medical condition. When the time came to leave, he was deemed, ironically, too sick to travel. He appealed his situation until he was shipped to Naples, Italy on the British Empire Clyde near the end of 1946. Here, his condition required him to be operated on and he had to appeal several times before he was allowed to return to Libya, where he went on to have children and grandchildren. It just goes to show that the suffering didn't always end for POWs when the war did. It took Labodio over six years after his capture to get back home. Captain Ian Hutchinson of the Australian 2nd 3rd Battalion ordered a platoon under his command to an advance on Italian machine gun position in a Sangar. When one of Hutchinson's privates got there, the private jumped on the wall and stood thrusting his bayonet at an Italian machine gun team, and another of Hutchinson's men kicked their heads below with his heavy boots. In the captured Sangar, Hutchinson saw a group of British tanks approaching and called to them, at which point they gunned one of his men down, clearly not British. Another of his men tried to throw a grenade at the tank, but it got caught in his own clothing and filled him with shrapnel. Hutchinson successfully defended his post against the Italian tanks and was awarded a military cross. But this isn't about him, it's about that poor guy who accidentally killed himself with his own grenade. How many sons didn't go home because of accidents like this? For less than 2,000 casualties, the WDF managed to kill 5,500, wound 10,000 and capture over 130,000 Italians of the 10th Army, as well as make them lose 420 tanks and 845 guns. It was a clean victory for the British, who initially planned Operation Compass as a 5 day raid but were ready to exploit success if it came their way. General Archibald Wavell wrote to Lieutenant General Henry Wilson saying, I do not entertain extravagant hopes of this operation, but I do wish to make certain that if big opportunity occurs, we are prepared morally, mentally, and administratively to use it to the fullest. So guys, that was part one of North Africa, Western Europe, and the Mediterranean. And I hope you guys thoroughly enjoyed that one. There's another part to come. So make sure you hold tight for that one and click the notification bell down below. So you stay up to date on all the videos of this series that are going to be coming out week by week. And just before you go, guys, if you're interested in some sick history merch, then make sure you check out the link in the description below, thefrontwear.com, where you can find a whole bunch of cool history designs where you can float anywhere at any time. They're all made of really high quality material. And as I just said, we've got some pretty cool designs there. So make sure you check that out. Anyways, guys, as always, thank you so much for watching. And I hope you learned something new.